All right. Um, okay, let's start. Let's first uh, review the what I've learned, right? Uh, how to design a controller if you have the input out to model. So you are giving the PA here, you are trying to design the bit forward controller and the bit by controller. Um, okay, what kind of procedure you want? First of all, okay, always all comes with the simpler the better, which means when you design the controller in let's say in a feedback, right? You try to use the limited order of the controller as low as possible. If you can dump by first order controller, of course it can also be solved with second order controller, okay? But of course then you should uh, use the simpler ones. Okay, there also is a last property of how about how do you design it. Uh, separation property, you can design the feedback controller first and then build the, the feed forward controller. Okay, uh, first, you should figure out the design requirements on about the R. Okay. Maybe there are two things, if, whether you want to cancel out the zeros, right? If you want to cancel out the zeros, then there's uh, this stable factor right, of, of the stable zeros can be included in R. Then uh, another uh, fact, factor is whether you want to deal with the disturbance. Okay, and then we say if you want to deal with the disturbance, you should know the sum of the property of the dis disturbance, right? Many the unstable factors related to the disturbance of that one. In my lecture, I only cover uh, the constant disturbance, but for the other type of the disturbance, you should read my lecture notes. Okay, also when you try to solve the homework assignments, there are more examples in my lecture notes. You should read, huh? you should read. Remember uh, there is a separate set of lecture notes right? I provided at the beginning of the, of the semester. Uh, when you design this, uh, there is a causality condition. Okay, this is also, also that, that's also one of the common mistakes made by the students. You always, the degree of the R right, has to be bigger than or equal to the degree of S. Otherwise, you will violate the causality condition. Causality condition means, right, that your current the input cannot depend upon the future output of some signals which are, avail are not available right now. But when you design this T of R, okay, for this part, you don't have to uh, obey the causality condition because the common signal, right? The common signal, we assume that you know the common signal in the future. What do you want the system to do in the future? Because that, that signal is available to you, right? You know. So, the common signal you say you know the beyond the bounds. So the, this one uh, is okay only for this part because this S will be operating on output Y. So the you cannot use the future output signal. Okay. okay after so therefore you first say okay what you are supposed to design R. So what are the factors about R? And then and then you. You are trying to solve the R and S by solving this equation. Look, basically this one, right? How do you do it? Um, you just plug in the expression of your R and S right into this equation. Then you compare the coefficients of this closed polynomial with the desired one, right? And then you all have a number of equations you solve. Okay. Okay. Once we design your R. Uh, the, the feedback and then the final step is the, the feed forward always the feed forward part is very easy. Yeah. When you in the middle of the procedure, right, if you encounter difficulty, say you don't have enough freedom, right? Normally it means that the number of the equations uh, is bigger than the number of the design parameters. So you, you don't, cannot find a solution. In that case, you always uh, you can increase the order of the controller such that you have more 
ठीक है ओके Of course, sometimes you may have a high pressure situation that you have two, too many uh, parameters, right? The number of parameters is more than the number of equations. In that case, either right, you you decrease the order of controller means that your current controller is too complicated, or you say, okay, I'm going just to set some of the parameters to be zero, right, to simplify your calculation. Okay. All right, um, so uh, both the big space approach and the input output approach, right, they rely on this, the same framework, right, we call the two degree of freedom controller. You, uh, there are two controllers to be designed. One is the feedback controller to match the pose, the other one is the big forward controller. Um, we will try to make the closed loop model follow the reference model as close as possible. So basically here, we say you are supposed to design a reference model, right? Um, and then the purpose is that uh, you are trying to make the closed loop model follow the reference model. That is a very popular approach. And this approach can be applied to most of the linear systems when you have the models. Well, but uh, but you may also ask, can we um, make the output follow any arbitrary command signal directly without using the reference model? So you say, okay, I, I want to have a simpler design. What, what do I uh, design the reference model? Can we just let you know, give me any design output? Let's uh, just let the, this. The output of the system follow this desired output directly. Okay, uh, this is the topic we are going to um, discuss today. Of course, yes, the answer is yes, theory, but uh, there are certain conditions to meet. Okay, um, so look, uh, here is the problem we try to solve. We have the input output model. Is given to you. And then we will try to follow the some reference signal okay, directly. The inverse model approach will be like this. Um, it's like we are just trying to solve some algebraic problem. We just assume that the output equals to the desired output. So which means that uh, I will just let the output y, y equals r and then can we find out the input? Okay. The, the logic will be like this. You say, okay, the output uh, and the input right, is related by this equation in the Z domain. Of course, now let, let's forget about the initial condition. Let's assume, right, that this is, and then we say, okay, the inverse model approach is, okay, I, let's say I can make the output equals the desired output, the reference signal. Okay, so you say, I've just replaced the, the, the output by mm -hmm. R, right? And then say whether can we solve the input? Easily, we can say the solution, right? Yes, of course, you say, looks like I just put my input in this way. If I put this R into this block diagram, this is, this is what it means, right? This is reference signal. You have B over A, so I'm going to put R over B there. It's trivial, right? Okay, let's say, um, that, does this work? And then let's take a, just to take a close look at a very simple system, let's say first order system like this, right? Uh, you have a, you know, first order means that the, the degree of, of the polynomial right, is, per, is one. Let's write down the difference equation for this one. So you have a Z here, operate on this, right? You'll get YK plus one plus A, YK equals UK, right? Okay. 
And then let's follow the inverse model approach. It means I'm going to make my output equals the, the reference signal R. And then let's assume that this can be achieved. Then what is the input? Okay, you already have, uh, you already know how to compute your input, right? Input is RK plus one plus A times R. Now you will say, do we have a causality problem? No, because the reference signal, you know, right? The, your, the desired output is given. Of course I know what is the desired output uh, uh, at the next step, right? Okay, so you can implement this controller without any issue. This is the controller, right, you see. I put this input on the left side, so the, those signals on the right side, which means I'm going to use these signals to compute the input, right? Okay. Um, this is the one, uh, okay, we, we follow, we use the equation in the time domain. But does it work? Right. Now let's try to get the transfer function right from the reference R signal R to the output. But right here, let's uh, we can uh, we can directly do it right. Uh, I mean without uh, going through the time domain equations. If we look at this one. At this stage, you should tell me if you multiply those two transfer functions together, of course, they are A and B, the all the common factors. Can you cancel them out? Should you cancel out A? Yes or no? You cannot, because this A operating on R, right? This A operating on Y, operating on the different signals. I mean, can you cancel out B? Right, this B is related to U, input U and this B is also operating on U, yes. Without going through the time domain equation, actually this is what you say, okay, this actually, this is transfer function relating the input and output, right? Clearly, there's the condition for this model to be stable. Right, is that okay? This one A has to be stable, otherwise, the system will be unstable. So, you can see now we can also get the answer from the without using the transfer function, right? We'll just get the answer from the equation directly. So, you this is the equation describing the system, right? This B and A. Now, but what is the input you are going to use? Okay, this is input you, you are going to compute. Right? And then from this one, you can say, uh, you apply the, the transform on both sides, then you get the transfer function. Right? You can say, you get the same answer, of course. And also, you from this one, you also know, yes, indeed, this B, you can cancel out, right? You can cancel out. Any questions? But so therefore, when does it work? In the ideal case, right? If if I can cancel out both, then of course the, the transfer function relates to the, the reference signal and output will just be a uh, one, which means zero. Output y equals to the reference signal, right? So what is the condition? What's the condition you can cancel out A? If it is stable, right? And also there is a, not only A, is the, how about B? Do we require B to be stable? You, you, the, your, your output, always remember, uh, when you check the, your design work control, right? actually that is also one mistake made by many people, even in some of the paper, right? Uh, 
when they when they validate the controller, they, they always they just look at the output, the proof that the output you know is bounded. Many times they didn't show whether the inputs. Here you can clearly say your transfer function related your reference signal to the input is A over B. What happens if B is unstable? Your input will blow up, right? So actually it requires both A and B to be stable. Then you have a very simple design. All right, okay. Uh, so if the system is unstable, of course, definitely it will fail. And also that is the well-known fact that I pointed out at the beginning. If the system is unstable, no matter what you do with your open loop control, right? The stability will not change. The open loop control will not change the stability of the system right? because the post cannot be moved, which can be only understood from the transfer function point of view, right? If you simply look at the I degree, right, the equation in the Z domain, you, you will not be able to understand that. Okay, let's look at this controller. Easily you can answer the, this question. Is it open loop control or feedback control? Of course, open loop, right? Look at this one. Your input does not depend upon the output at all. You don't have to observe, get the information from the output, right? Okay. And also, which can be which can be checked are from the time domain expression. How to compute the input? You can say the input only depends upon R. Does not depend upon the output. Okay. Now let's just draw some simple modification. This is where R we have an open loop controller. And we found out that it doesn't work. Now I want you to just modify this one, right? This feedback controller, uh, this open loop controller a little bit such that it can become a feedback controller, which also means I want to use the output signal in the controller. What is the simplest way to make it into a feedback controller? Which signal can be replaced by the output? RK plus one or RK? Can you replace RK plus one by YK plus one? Or can you replace uh, y RK by YK? Which one? Of course, only R of K can be replaced, right? Yes. I use the real output instead of the desired output. Well, let's just make that change. Let's just make this one change here. Replace right R with output. Okay, and then let's verify does it work now? So I plug this into the system equation. So this one right equals UK, but UK equals RK plus one plus A. YK. You can realize something, right? Both sides that have this A times YK can be cancelled out. What do you have? is that if you implement your input with this signal, right, your output at the next step will hit your target. So it's kind of magically, right, all of a sudden, it works. Okay, so now here we have a solution. How do we follow the output? Desired output directly, which I can just design my controller in this way. Now let's try to explain this with a, another point of view, right? Because right now we say, okay, what happens is just like just make it into a feedback controller. But what is the reason behind that? To understand that, we need to rewrite the the system equation in a different form. 
let's say this is the way where we put the input on one side and I put the output on the other side. But however, I'm going to do it in this way. I put this YK plus one on the one side and move this, uh, you know, a YK to the right hand side. I have an equation like this. And now I can interpret this equation as a predictor. Because, right, I mean, if you look at the left hand side, that is a output in the future, right? Let's just consider K as present. So here I have output signal in the future on the other right hand side, means, right, there are the signals at present, but in, in general, they may contain signals in the past. So on the right hand side, if you have an equation such that right, um, on, the, on the left hand side corresponding to just one future signal and on the right hand side they correspond to the past and present signals of course then we can consider this as a predictor right you are using the present and the history to predict the future does that make sense? Okay. Once you have an equation like that, then you will ask the question, what control action at the present, right, with UK? You should apply such that, right, such that the future output which you predicted can match the desired output, desired value, RK plus one. The once you have a predictor, the, you ask this question, and then you try to solve that. Then how to solve that is simple. So I just take the problem and solve, which means I'm going to make it happen, right? This yk plus one predicted value equals the desired value, rk plus one. And then I will plug this into the predictor your predicted value will be the desired value, and then you try to solve the, your input signal, UK, from that equation. Okay. Any questions? The idea is straightforward, right? You have a predicted value. I want the predicted value match some desired value. You have an equation. From that equation, you try to figure out what is the input. Correct? Okay. Then the control input can, can be easily found out. See? So I have an equation. From this equation, right, I compute my input. This controller is exactly the, the feedback controller we have uh, found out. All right. In general, that is the idea behind the predictive control. It is called a predictive, which means you have to have a predictor, right? Predictor, prediction means that you use the present and the past information to predict the future. For example, right there, for in general form, it will be like this. You have a future signal, right? On, on one side and then on the other side, right, will be a function, which depends upon the current and the past information. All those signals are available. You use available information to predict the future. Okay, any questions? Any questions on the meaning of the predictor? Why it is in this form? So remember, uh, on the right hand side, all the signals must be available, right? Otherwise, we are what do you mean a predictor? I, I cannot make something right, which is uh, not available. I use that to the prediction. So which well, does that make sense? On the left hand side uh, is something of course not available, but you can predict. Okay, once you have a predictor, then you ask the question: What control action at the present would bring the future output into some desired output? So therefore, you take the problem and solve, right? You just make the predicted value equals the 
desired value, you will have an equation relating the desired value and the input and output. From this equation, you can compute the input signal. For our linear system, of course, this one is straightforward. Once you have this, you can directly, there's only one solution about the input. But of course, for the long linear system, which may not be straightforward, because once you have this equation, you don't know whether the solution exists or not. That is one problem. The other problem is that because it's a long linear equation, if there are solutions, there may be multiple solutions. And then you will face a problem, which input right, you want to use. Okay? But for linear system, we, we don't face those problems because this linear equation is very easy to solve. So graphic, graphic to you is like this, right? I mean, from the present, right? I plan I input, I know I can predict the output, right? And then I just replace the predicted value with the desired value. Then I have an equation. Then I will try, I, I'll try to go back and compute what is the input I'm supposed to apply, okay? Look at the idea you are. It's very straightforward and easy. Huh? Okay, um, now let's apply this idea to the general case for the general uh, linear system because we just found a very special case, right? Let's look at how we're going to do it for the general case. In general case, let's say I have a system which is described by a transfer function. Okay, for the predictive control, we are going to change the way we write the transfer function. So instead of using U, there we are going to use the backwards chapter there to the minus one. Right, the, this A, those polynomials will be written in this way. So the A, the, the first one, the highest one, I'm going to write as one, and then the next one, I'm going to write, you know, the, the cube to the minus one or cube to the minus two, because we want to, because right now we are talking about the prediction, right? So we are interested in the present and the past signals. One is the present, right? If the, the backward shape, those, those correspond to the signals in the past. Let's, Let's just uh, work out one example such that you immediately know what, what, what does this mean, right? Uh, now, this is the normal way we write on the transfer function. Okay. Um, I can backward shift uh, both, both sides by two. So I quickly, I just multiply like numerator denominator by z to the minus two. You can say, I will change this transfer function in this way. In this way, of course, then you can say, okay, here, this corresponding to A, right? It starts from one. And then the numerator, right, will start from, a, you know, what degree will be lower than the denominator here, it, it starts from Z to the minus two. Okay. So the conversion is straightforward, right? The normal expression to, uh, expression with those uh, backward shift. Okay, uh, how do we write down the difference equation? Okay, once we have this one, then we shall try to write the difference equation if A is in this way and B is in this form. Because let's say A times Y right, and B times U, so therefore, in the time domain expression, this one corresponding to yk, q to the minus one, that will be y to the k, y k minus one, right, times a one. So the last one is y k minus n. For the input signal, it starts from the first one, right, it will be, we'll have q minus d, right, so therefore the first signal is k minus d, and then you have this b1u k minus d minus one. 
Okay. Now, let's talk about the physical meaning of this uh, time delay D here. If If the time delay, let's say, is one, okay, and then let's say, then you have something like this, which is yk plus one. Okay, I, then I put those things, you know, on this side, we will get minus A1, YK. But then the input signal was starting from UK. So you can say you apply an input, input UK, right? The present input that your output will be affected immediately at the next step. If the D equals, right, if the D equals, not equals one, you may say will be like the, you know, the D, if D equals two, Then actually, this one, you want to know what is the output will be uh, impacted by the input, then this one will become two. Okay, um, mathematically it's like that, but physically it means, it just means that's the time you have to wait till the system to respond. You apply our input, how would that input? influence the output. It takes time. Okay? If the time is very short, then the K equals one, right? Just one sample period that you know, it will be affected. Otherwise it may it may wait, right? It may wait. Okay. Um for example, right you if you want to remote remotely control something you know on the moon you send a signal on the earth it takes some time right but anyway so i have a, a simpler application here for you to see the test setup you you switch the off relay. the circuit this is a delay box, relay so this off, is but... a simple uh, complex fluorescent light bulb but so you can design it with approximately a 12 13 watt circuit this is AC power, and this is the trigger circuit. It's currently connected in a normally open format, hence the bulb is off. Right now I have it to immediate relay, meaning every time I touch the trigger wire to power, it will turn the bulb on. I'm going to do this a couple times to demonstrate. So touching the trigger wire to power, boom, immediately the light bulb turns on. So if I hold the trigger wire to power, light stays on. Take the wire away from power, light turns off. Touch it. You know, when you turn it off, turn it off, it off the bulb things. will. What the heck does this thing do? This is our delay relay. I then can you can add some delay. delay. Relay that, when you, you switch know, off, wait a second before you turn off the light every time a trigger happens. So now when I trigger it, it, there's a fixed amount of time in between every trigger. If I stay on it, the bulb will stay lit as long as I stay on it. The moment that I take the trigger source off, that amount of time is still added. So just to grossly exaggerate everything, and I have it set to five seconds. So when I touch it, just for a moment, it'll at least stay on for five seconds. Now, of course, if I had it connected and I kept keeping it connected in between those five seconds, it automatically resets that timer so that at least five seconds happen after a triggered event. So it's all disabled right now. It'll turn off after five seconds. Boom, we're done. That's a delay relay. Okay. Good. Okay. Yeah. And um, that explains uh, the meaning of D. All right. Uh, let's uh, 
there are some difference uh, with the computer design, whether the time delay is one or bigger than one. Let's look at the simpler case where the time delay is one. We have a very straightforward solution. So when the time delay is one, right, you have this equation. So you have this yk, right, yk minus one on the left side. You have this uk minus one, uk minus two. Uh, first of all, right, I, I want to have an equation. Remember, I want to use an equation such that we can compute the input, right? So therefore, that equation should have the input, the current input, uk, in that equation. Right now, of course, the, we, we have the uk minus one. So how do I make the equation? Uh, how do I make this uk minus, minus one into uk? What should we do? How do we change the equation such that it will contain uk instead of uk minus one? Simple, right? You just forward shift both sides. You forward shift both sides, then you have this equation. They are the same. Okay. And then, of course, right now it's not obvious, but let's put all the, let's on the left side, I only keep the yk plus one. I'm going to move all the other output to the right hand side. This is what we have. You look at this equation. This is equation. On the left hand side is our output at the next step, right? On the right hand side, it contains the input, the current input, and also the current and the past output, right? And the past output, uh, past inputs. Therefore, it is a predictor, right? And then we ask the question, how do we choose the input such that the output equals to the reference signal, the desired output? So we take the problem as solved, right? We replace the output by the desired output. We have an equation. Can you compute the input from this equation? Easy, right? So you say, okay, this is the input you can compute, of course. If you look at this one, all the signals are available, right? Okay, no problem, right? To implement. So easy, yeah? Huh? So see, I just compute my input in, in this equation, the uh, immediately I can hit my target at next step. Is this simple? Very simple, right? Okay. I mentioned uh, there may be some tricky issues when the D is bigger than one. Let's check one example. Okay, let's say the YK right here. I mean, on the left side, if I'm YK, YK minus one. On the right hand side, if the input starts from Y, the, you know, starts from K minus two. In this case, what is the time delay? Two, right? So, like I said, right, I mean, we won't have an equation such that it contains the current input. So this one, how do we convert this equation such that it can have a current input, UK? What should we do? We just for forward shift by two. Look at this one, right? Okay, now let's just apply our idea. We say, okay, look, I, I just let my this one, yk plus two equals rk plus two. Okay, and then from this equation, right, and I try to solve for the input. Okay, I was also computing my input in this way. Of course, if this can be done, your output will match the desired output, right? But if you look at this equation again, is there any problem with this controller?
Can you implement this controller? Which signal is not available? YK plus one. Remember, our YK, RK plus one, no problem. Reference signal, desired output, you know, right? You design it. Of course, you know what is the desired value, you know, 10 steps from now, right? Even so, but YK plus one, that's the signal, right? Which is making trouble. Then we say, okay, then we go back and which step are, is wrong, right? What's going wrong? This equation, right? This equation from our definition about the predictor, right? The, the left hand side should be a signal in the future, no problem. Or the right hand side should contain the signals which are available, right? Which are available. So, therefore, if you look at this one, can we call this equation as a predictor? We cannot because yk plus one is not available, right? So no, we cannot use the future, predict the future. Okay. Therefore, let's try to overcome this, right? Try to overcome this. We know this is not a predictor. So we have to change it into a predictor. Then we say we have to deal with the troublemaker, like a plus one. Then we ask the question, look, I don't know the output, the future output, right? I cannot measure that. But can we predict it? Can we predict the future value YK plus one using the present and past information? You look at this equation again and think about that and give me the answer, yes or no? Actually, yes, right? If you use this equation, you just backward shift by one. You have an equation, right? This is the future output. You have the current output and the past input. All the information on this side available, right? Actually, yes, you can say yes. I'll say, although I don't have the output signal, in the future, but I can predict it. Then I just replace the YK plus one by its prediction. Then we have this one. Replace YK plus one by YK plus UK minus one. Now we check this one, or this one is the output two steps ahead, right? This one. Current output, right? The current input and the past input, all the signals available, right? Therefore, do we have a predictor now? We do, right? Okay, once I have a predictor, right, then we try to solve the problem, right? How do we go to uh, match the desired output? Here, we will replace the YK plus two by RK plus two, Good, right? We will replace it. RK plus two by future output, by the future desired output. I want to make this happen, right? I want to make this happen, and now I want to find out what is the, the input I should apply at present. So easily, you can compute the input by this equation, right? Okay, so the lesson we have learned from this example is that you have a different equation, then you try to um, put it into a form such that that equation contains the input UK, right? And then you try to figure out whether it is a predictor. If it is not in a form of predictor, then you try to turn it into a predictor. Once you have a predictor, then the problem can be easily solved, okay? So the concept of what is a predictor is very important. Now, with this one, we are ready to handle the general case.
Okay, the general case is that the time delay is D. Then when we put down this difference equation will be this form. On this side, we have this yk, yk minus one. And here on this side, we have this uk minus d, uk minus d minus one. Okay. Then the question we ask is, can we express the output of a system at time t plus d in the following predictor form? So we will try to find out a predictor which predicts the output d steps ahead with the current input because the time delay is d, right? It takes d steps to for the output to be affected. Therefore, for this system, we are not interested in to predict yk plus 1. We are interested to predict yk plus d, d steps ahead because we are interested in how do we com how to compute the input UK. The car current input can only affect the output D steps ahead. So obviously, right, this predictor is different from is the original equation of the system, right? So therefore, the purpose is that we will try to say whether we can do something on this original equation, such that we have this kind of predictor. Then we can write the predictor right with the shift operator, okay? If we use the shift operator, of course, not to make the equation in a very compact form. Of course, definitely this is the predictor only in the present, right, K and K, right, and the past, right, those K minus one, K minus two, predicted using the Present past predicts the future. Okay, so this is the starting point. That this is the difference equation relating the input and output. We won't have an equation with the input. Right now, it has the input signal UK minus D, but we want the current input to appear right UK. So what should we do? forward shape by how many steps? D, of course, I want to make this UK minus D as UK, right? So forward shape by D, then we will have this equation. Now, if I just simply, right, keep the YK plus D on this side and put all the other output signal on the right-hand side, and of course, I keep the input signals. Is this in the form of a predictor? We have some signals in the future, right? So it has some future outputs, yk plus one, yk plus two, up to yk plus d minus one. So I have to deal with those future signals. Let's deal with them one by one. Let's first look at k plus one. Look at this equation. Probably we'll just look at the first equation that will be simpler. Is it possible to predict k plus one? Y k plus one? Look at this equation. Yes or no? If I just uh, forward shift this by one, so every signal should be available, right? I forward shift this equation by one, so we have yk plus one, this yk minus one becomes yk, yk is okay, present one. So this is the input signal, of course, is just yk minus d plus one. Remember, d is bigger than one, right? So those are the past input signals. All the signals are available. Indeed, we can't predict yk plus one, right? Okay. Then how about yk plus two? You just look at this equation. Can we predict yk plus two? If we forward shift this by one, this is what we're going to get. 
just four version for this one, we're going to work it plus two in this form. But if you look at this equation, is that is that in the form of predictor? There is a yk plus one, right? There is a yk plus one there. But the other signals, they are okay, right? The current and the, the past. This one, of course, they are, you know, the past input signals. But unfortunately, there is a, a, a one future signals we have to deal with. Now, here comes the problem. Okay. This one by as it stands, it is not a predictor. But can you make it into a predictor? What should we do? We we know why k plus one is not available, but we can predict it, right? I can just plug in the expression of this yk plus y into this equation. We will have a predictor for yk plus two. Is that clear? So just replace yk plus one with its predictor form. That's the way we can deal with yk plus two. Now you imagine, right, you can, you or probably, you already get this idea, right? So therefore, for the yk plus d minus one, that's the signal we also have to deal with. This is the original form. How do we go to predict this one? How do we do those future values of the output? You can predict yk plus one. You can predict yk plus two. Of course, you can predict yk plus three, right? This yk plus d minus one, all those future signals, you just replace them by their prediction. Then, Right, you replace the yk plus one, yk plus two, yk plus three, yk plus d minus one, minus two with the predictions. Then you will have a predictor, which can predict the yk plus d minus one. But of course, you will say, oh, that is complicated. Yes, it is complicated, but you can do it, right? You can do it repeatedly. Eventually, right, we deal with this yk plus d. It depends upon the sum of the future values. We can always turn it into a predictor form, right? Whenever I have those future values, we replace it with the predictions. So eventually, we will have a equation which is in a form such that on one side, you have the yk plus d, but on this right-hand side, all the signals, right? All the signals are the present and the past signals. Okay? That is the way you can build a predictor. So once you have the predictor, then the rest is simple. Then you ask the question, right? How are we going to compute the input? Right? Where I say, okay, I'm going to compute the input in this way such that the yk plus d will match the desired output r k plus d, right? So we say, okay, I then I just, I will have an equation. I will make this predicted value, match the desired value. Then I have, have an equation. From this equation, I can easily compute the input signal. Okay, any question? Now, again, right, I mean, just the similar as in the past, we have to check whether all the signals are bounded. We know this, right, the resulting closed loop system, we know that the yk plus d will be equal to rk plus d if we, if we apply the control. So in this way, right, we compute the input in that by that equation for every step. Of course, this will happen, right? So of course, definitely, 
the output will be bounded as long as your reference signal is bounded. Or I can put this equation, it's the same as yk equals rk, right? Of course, the k has to be bigger than or equal to d. If you apply the input, right, at the first step. Okay, so therefore, it means that actually the output can follow the desired output exactly at every step after some time, right? After some time, okay. Now let's look at this. This is the relation between the input and output. Then we say, after a while, right, all the output signals will be equal to the reference signal, right? So therefore, after a while, when k is bigger than or equal to d plus m, not just d, uh, because when k equals d, you only match the, your k, yk plus d equal to, right? Then it takes uh, one more step to get the yk uh, plus d plus one. Okay, and then you want to make all the signals match, right? One by one, so it takes n steps to make all the outputs match. After that, then it will match forever, right? So, but anyway, after a while, I mean, this is the relation between the input and the reference signal. Or if we get the transfer function from the reference signal to the input, this is the result, right? It is just A over B. Remember, uh, remember, this is the closed loop. This is the closed loop transfer function. It does not mean this is your, this is your controller, because we know if you implement the controller in this way, it will not work, right? Here right now we just analyze the transfer function such that we understand the condition whether the inputs will be bounded or not. But if we look at this transfer function, what is the condition to assure that the input signals are bounded? What's the condition of B? B has to be stable, right? You can say we encountered this condition many times already, right? For the state space approach, we know this is the condition we can match the reference model. Then for the input output model approach, we say, okay, this is also the condition such that we can do the perfect tracking, right? But here again, you are saying, okay, I'm going to try to follow the reference signal directly. We do need this one, okay? If the purpose is not to follow it direct any reference signal directly, the purpose is just to make the system stable. Do we need this condition? Do we need this condition? Do we need this condition for stabilization? What I why I'm here is answer yes. Nobody said no. The answer is no, of course, right? If you just try to stabilize the system, if you just try to put the poles to the desired positions, of course I don't require any condition on B. I don't require any condition on A. What I require is that the system is stable, uh, is uh, controllable, right? Or if you are uh, Transfer function is mean that there the are low comma, close and zero, right? So we only need this condition when we want to get some perfect result. I want to have a perfect match of the reference model. I want to follow the reference signal perfectly. Then we record this condition, okay?
stable inverse condition it required for the perfect match. So this is the price we have to pay for perfect tracking. Now this idea is not on simple, but also the, it has this last property that it can be directly applied to nonlinear system. For example, consider the body nonlinear system, right? So in a quadratic form, but definitely it's a nonlinear one this y square, one this the input times the output. Right? But if you look at the equation describing the system, is it in a form of predictor? Yes, right? Yes. So therefore, if we want to desire a component, I can just use this equation because it is already in a form of predictor. I just match the desired output with the, the predict output with the desired output. And then I compute my input from this equation. This equation, of, of course, is simple. Right, it's a simple nonlinear model, so therefore you have a, an easy solution for this input. But this, if you apply this input to the system, what will be the output at the next step? Of course, this will be output at the next step. It can hit the target in one step, right? Okay. Because the idea of predictor is not limited to linear system, right? It can be applied to general system. Now, when you look at this system again, can you design a power placement controller directly for this system? You cannot, right? You have to linearize it first because in its current form, you don't know. I mean, what are the poles for the original system, right? We'll talk about the poles that's only for the system which can be described by a, either a transfer function or a state space model or a linear model, right? But here it is a nonlinear system. So we, can, we cannot say what are the poles. Right, and then, of course, we cannot do the power placement. Okay, now let's come back to answer this question. Can we make it output follow the upper common signal without the reference model? I just show you the way, right? It is possible to solve the control problem without the reference model. Did we put any constant on the desired output R in the solution? Did we put any condition on the reference signal? We did that, right? The desired output can be arbitrary. But there are certain ideas. There is a condition for perfect tracking. So do you remember what's the condition? Under what condition will this controller work? P has to be stable. Okay, let's say the system right, actually satisfies this condition. Does that mean that it will come with this type of system to whatever we like? In theory, yes, right? Because your desired output is arbitrary. But in reality, right, can you make the car run faster than the jet plane? No, right, no. The reason is that in all the solutions, we didn't put any limit on the cost of the control. 
We know, yes, we do try prove that the signals will be bounded, right? We say, yes, all the inputs and output signals are bounded. We prove that they will not go up to infinity. But in theory, right, both one and one meaning are bounded. But in practice, it means that actually only one is bounded. One meaning is not bounded. One meaning can be considered as infinity. Okay, so there is a difference between a practical bounded list and a theoretical bounded list. Okay, that's the reason. Huh? Okay, um, if we look at the one step ahead, right, feedback control from another perspective is that from the optimization point of view is that actually we try to minimize this cost function. This cost function involves only the output signals, right? You can say, I want to minimize this. If I, of course the solution is that the, the minimum value is zero, right? When the YK plus D equals the desired output RK plus D, it will be zero. You, you solve this minimization problem, then you get a controller. That controller will make your output equals the desired output. But in this cost function, we didn't include right, the penalty on the expense on the control signals. Right? So you, if we want to solve this one, we say, OK, if the control signals is too large, the cost will be huge. Is that way we may find a better controller such that you will keep a balance between right, the objective of making the output follow the desired output exactly. And while I want to limit, right, limit the expense on the control. So we need to achieve a compromise between the bring the output and the cost of the control effort. This is the starting point of the so-called modern predictive control. Okay, that will be the one of the main topics in part two, uh, you are going to learn that, how to solve that. All right, so with that, let's have a break. Then in the next half, I will just do an overview of what we have learned uh, for this Six lectures. Let's have 50 minutes. All right, uh, welcome back. So let's start. So we'll go over what we have learned for part one. <clears throat> In the first lecture, right, we revisited some of the fundamental concepts you have learned in the past. So uh, you are supposed to be familiar with most of them. But probably accept the concept of the state. I mean, many of you probably just have a very rough idea about what is state. So for this one, we give a very precise definition about the state of the system, right? It means that the information you needed to predict the future, assuming the current and all the future inputs are available. So from this definition, you can find out out what are the state variables for the dynamic system. Okay, and then starting from the second lecture, we started with the, how do we make a computer control system? We did the 
convert the signals from continuous time to discrete time and also from the discrete time to continuous time. How do we do the conversion from the analog signal to digital signal? So basically, this one is very commonly used with sampling. Uniform sampling, that's the commonly used one with something period, or something extract the signals at the uniform time intervals. How do we convert the signals back from the discrete time to analog? This one, we say we use the zero order code for the control system. We hold the signals as a constant uh, until at the next company instead we have the new signals to update because in between there are no new signals, right? From one sampling instance to the next one, you have no idea about what is going on between that. So therefore, for a system, you if you want to have a good performance, right? Normally you need a smaller sampling period such that you know. Okay, during the sampling periods, the signals were almost the same. Huh? Will behave well if you have a longer sampling period, right? The the signals may the behaviors may be very uh widely. You don't have control during the sampling instance, right? It's an open loop. Okay, then we have to derive the state space model. We start from the Continuous time model, this APC. Many of you are taking the other course, right? Uh, the linear systems. And you know, okay, you know the ABC, and the, you know the solution from the Laplace transform, right? We can't get the solution in the S domain, but then we can, you know, get the solution in the S domain, and then we do the inverse Laplace transform, we get the solution in the time domain. So those are the Expressions we use the matrix exponential, right? E to the AT. Um, by the zero order hold, we divide, uh, we put this, you know, this T, we compute the, the sampling, uh, the solutions during one sampling period. Then we get that one, and then we figure out those are the phi and the, the gamma. In the homework assignments, of course, you are supposed to get the numbers for phi and gamma. Not just give me the formula, right? The whole purpose of that assignment is that you, if you are dealing with a physical system, how you go to go to get the model by the formulas, right? Do you know how to use the formulas? That's the whole purpose, right? You know, you already know the theory. How are you going to use the theory to get the numbers? Okay. Of course, everything will depend upon. Whether you know how you get the, this uh, e to the at uh, matrix exponential, the simple way, right, is that you use the Laplace transform. This one is the, the Laplace transform. You do the inverse Laplace transform. When you do that, you need to use the Laplace transform table, right? There is a table for you to use. Okay, and then. To deal with the discrete time, we say we, we, we cannot use Laplace transform because you cannot do an integration, right? Then instead, I will introduce another way. We say, okay, Z transform, the equivalent of Laplace transform. So, this is the definition of the Z transform, right? If you have any discrete time signals, I can always write down it, it's Z transform. So, remember why the, the Z transform only do with the signal starting with some initial ones, if whatever happens in the past, it lose all the information, right? Whatever in the past. Most important property, how do we relate, right? XK plus one and XK in the Z domain, we derive this relation. And then we, Derive uh, the interpretation of the the z right? We say okay, when x zero equals zero, I still have this one. It means that the how do we interpret it? Z is a time shift operator, and z to the minus one, 
that is the bifold shift operator. Okay, then we say with that one, we apply the Z transform, we can get the solution. So the, the Z transform applied to the state space model, um, we can easily find out the solution, right? In the Z domain or X, it depends upon the initial condition, it depends upon the input, then you get the output. Depends upon the initial condition, depends upon the input. If the initial condition is zero, so we only left the consider the impact of the system right by the input signal. So in this way, we say that output right is related to the input only, and then we have this transfer function. What is the transfer function? Okay, here we, this is the one we define the transfer function from the input output mod, from the state space model. This is the one you can get the transfer function. Of course, there are some special case that may, the, this answer may not be correct, right? The special case, if you use this formula, you get a transfer function. And if the transfer function have no comma, holds are zeros, so that will be the correct answer, right? If the transfer function have a common points and zeros, then you have to check. You have to check. Depends upon whether the system is controllable or observable, right? And then you have to check. If they have common points and zeros, it means one of them will happen. It is either uncontrollable or unobservable. Okay. If it is observable, this if a system is observable, this is always the correct answer. Okay, if it is not observable, right, normally it means that the order of the transfer function will be lower than the order of your state space model. Right. So, but of course, in practice, in practice, you have the, you know, those models. Normally, the cancellation rarely happens. Huh? But in theory, it may happen. But anyway. This is the one, right? Once you have this one, then you, then you can, you, you have the phi gamma, say so you can get the denominator of the transfer function, which is just the determinant of this matrix, the i minus phi. How, what can you do with the transfer functions? There are many things you can do, right? Give a transfer function. There is always be associated with a different equation, right? You, if you just you know uh, interpret it with z as the forward shape operator, okay. The other thing is that you can calculate the output when the initial conditions are zero. But we, in general, we know the output will depends upon the initial condition, right? So, but we also know that if the system is stable, right? If the system is stable, the zero input response will go to zero. So if system is stable, right, it is safe huh, that we, we just need the transfer function. It just means at the beginning, there may be some difference, but eventually, right, eventually, it will be a, a good way to compute the output. And uh, we know that the transfer function is also the impulse response because for the impulse signal, the the transform of the input signal is one. That's how we get the trans get this result. And uh, once you have the transfer function, the stability did the stability can be determined right by checking the pose of the transfer function. And also we, we have this formula, but this formula remember uh, it only applies to the case where the system is stable. For stable system. How you get the the response to the exponential signal? Actually, this is a formula. This is the response to the exponential signal in the steady state. Then from this one, you can easily compute some of the special case. For example, when the A is one, right? You have a, a step, step input. You can say, of course, the output is just uh, H, right? H of one times 
So therefore, that's why you use this one to compute this DC gain or the state state gain. That's the gain used to the input, which is a constant. And, and then this one is also important, right? When the h of a equals zero, right? You have the signal blocking property. We use it, this one for disturbance rejection. Okay. Um, for example, right? If you want the effect of the disturbance to be zero, right? Actually, just put h of one, right? Equals zero. You have a one as the, the zero. Okay, and then we talk about the stability concept. We also, you know, discuss there are two types of this stability, whether it's variable stable or asymptotic stable. We know that in general, right, the stability concept is local because the learning system can have uh, some points maybe stable, but some other equilibrium point may be uh, unstable. But for linear systems, we actually, we didn't show the proof, but it can be proven that if it's isotropic stable, it is always BIBO stable. And we derive the stability criterion with two different points of view, right? But remember, for the discrete time, right? When you check the stability, you just look whether it is inside the unit circle or not. This, uh, you compute the, you have to put the poles into its exponential form, uh, the magnitude and the phase. They just look at the magnitude. It's bigger than, smaller than one inside, it's stable. If it's outside, well, it is unstable. If it is on the unit circle, then there are two cases, whether it's a single pole or a, a multiple pole. Simple pole is marginally stable. If it's multiple, it is unstable. But remember, when you design a system, you, you level what we call stable, which does not include the marginally stable. So therefore, in short, I remember stability criteria is that the magnitude is inside the unit circle. Well, so I think, of course, the, there are some cases in the past that because the, the students are so impressed by the stability criteria that all the poles has to be to the left half of the plan. They have such a strong impression, such that they forget that for discrete time, it is different. Of course, I hope a lot of you will make a mistake. In your exam, you so you design a pole, design the pole such that the real part is negative part. But do remember because some students are taking the linear system. Uh, linear system is for continuous time. Stability criteria for those two types are different. Don't mix up, uh, don't mix up. For continuous time, left half of the plane, right? For the discrete time, inside the unit circle. Okay, and then of course we say um, if the degree of the system is big, it's not easy to compute the poles, uh, how do we check the stability without solving the equation? Then we have the jury's stability test. We say, okay, look, if you have a polynomial and then you just need to give me the coefficients and then we can compute, right? So you have a polynomial, you get the coefficients, you put them into a row, and then you try to eliminate the last element of the coefficient one by one. Then to do it, you need another row to help, right? So therefore you use the same row, but you reverse the order. And then you try to do some elementary operation of these two rows, right? You name, you name the last element. So essentially therefore you multiply this row by a n over a naught, a naught, so such that the last element becomes a n, then you can unsubtract that such that then this last element will be zero. In this way, then you will get a new row, right? New row, and then you repeat this process again, and then try to eliminate the last element. So until all the elements are zero. Okay, and then stop the only one element left, and then you check whether all the elements, right? The first element is 
Do they have the same sign or not? Okay, you see. All positive, of course. It turns out if all of them are all negative, it is also fine, right? It just means you put all the numbers right up on the on the on the numbers with a minus sign. Okay, it will not affect the result. Controllability, we talk about uh, basically the we need to understand whether I can uh, put a, a control input, right? Apply a sequence of input such that the state can move from one position to another in finite time. Right? Apply input, it will move, but it can go to the destination. Then from that one, we compute the controllability matrix. We say um, you can do it in Find that time, right? It depends upon the order of the system. If the order is n, you can do it in n steps, right? If you cannot do it in n steps, then it's hopeless. Right? So we we'll prove that. And then we say the geometric interpretation of this matrix, right? Um, is that are all the possible directions to go in the state space? It has n directions, right? You can go in any independent directions in the n-dimensional space, you can go anywhere easily, right? From that point of view, that will help you to understand this condition. Now, how do we prove that? It's uh, based upon the beautiful theory in linear algebra, the Kelly Hamilton theory says that the matrix satisfies its own correctness polynomial. But if we put it into our other form, right, we rewrite that equation into this form, it says that the matrix to the power of m, right, can be expressed by as the linear combination of its lower powers. Okay. Then about the observability. Then observability, this one, we will try to solve the problem, right, uh, by observing the input and output signal can reconstruct the state information. So we say, okay, we can interpret it, right, this, uh, you know, just the output is just a projection of the state. Different outputs is a projection of the same state, but along different directions. They will have our uh, equation and then we can solve. So therefore, of course, you come from this equation, we say, yes, the, this observability matrix has to be non-singular. But then we say, okay, how do we interpret it from a, a geometric point of view? We say, okay, we can interpret those directions as the directions for the state vector to be uh, projected onto. Therefore, geometrically, if you have the information about a state vector in different directions, even in the n-dimensional space, if you have uh, the information about the state in any independent directions, then you can reconstruct the original state vector. So that's the idea of <clears throat> behind this equation. If you cannot expand the whole space, then the state information along some directions will never be available, and the system is not observable. And then we talk about the controllable canon canonic form, right? In this form, this one is always controllable. Remember, if a system is in a controllable canonic form, don't even have to check the you don't even have to check the controllability right let's say in the exam question say ask you whether the system is controllable sometimes actually the, the equation is already in the control canonical form for this type of question the shortcut to that one so okay it is in control of the canonical form you say it is controllable the answer is correct okay otherwise right you say you don't know this you still can check the controllability matrix
übersetzt haben wir sie in Observer bekannt an die Kuh. It is also currently to be always observable. Then, okay, those are the corresponding transfer functions, right? The, the, diff, the relation you can say uh, between those two, the one is the, the other one transpose. But are these two canonical form equivalent to each other? Not really, right? Not really. Only if the system is both controllable and observable. Okay. If a system is both controllable and observable, it also means if you form the, the, the formula to compute, the transfer function, that transfer function will not have any common poles and zeros. All right. And then, okay, from those, uh, the, we spent three weeks uh, on the fundamental concepts. And then we move on to talk about how do we design control system. Right, so we want to, you know, whenever you want to change, right, the behavior of the system means you want to control. Okay, and then, Feedback control is one way to do it, right? There are some other ways to do it, but those those ways are not the concern of the control theory. A control theory, we thought down with the feedback. You use the, you have the output, right? Information, right? And then you observe the output compared with the desired output. You have the error signal, then you decide whether how we to going to make the correction. So uh, we want to make the output follow the desired output as close as possible, and then we use the feedback to achieve the goal. How do we, the remaining parts, right? We, we touched upon all the parts. When you design that, first of all, how do we get the reference signal, right? Or the desired output. The reference signal, Right, in many cases, in, in this way, we focus on one approach where we use the reference model to generate the reference signal. Right? Um, this is also a very popular approach because we know there is some limitation on the on the ways, right, on the control signals we can generate. And then we, with the better build a reference model, okay, and then we want our close look to follow the reference model. So the build the reference model is very simple. You can just build a second order uh, system as a reference model because we have the perfect knowledge about the behavior of the reference of the second order system, right? All those formulas you can use. So once you know the performance requirements on overshoots on the for the step response, right, and for the settling time, you use those formulas to figure out right the second order system, and then you can design your reference model. Then once we have the reference model, the problem becomes how we're going to design the control system we can match the reference model. To do that, so we rely on those two degree of freedom controller. That will be the I think this is the big difference between what you have learned when you were an undergraduate, right? Undergraduate, we normally we say one feedback bit con one feedback controller can do it for all, right? Like you have a PID controller, you have only one PID controller. But here we say if you want to achieve more, right? You, you want to you know, follow the reference model exactly, one controller will not work. We have to rely on uh, two controllers, right? We have a feedback controller, we have the speed forward control, and then we can achieve the objective. The feedback control, right, the purpose, you just try to place the pose. The feed forward controller, right, then you also want to match the zeros. Then we spend one week on the state space approach, where you know the phi, gamma, and C, And then we first get the solution for the simplest case, right, where you have the state information, which are going to get it. Then it turns out you just use kind of a proportional control. Of course, because the state vector is a 
is not a skater, right? So therefore, your gain is not a skater. It is a vector such that the proportional control becomes a linear combination of the state variables. And if there is a disturbance, right? You say, okay, I'm go also going to, you know, use the, the disturbance signal to compute the input. Of course, in reality, we say we don't have those signals, then you say, okay, we are going to build the observer for that. If you we have the state space model available. After we design the feedback controller, right? You can see this feedback controller involves many steps, right? You first have to design your air and air omega. For this observer, you have to design the gains to make the observer stable, right? And then you build the feed forward part, that one is straightforward. Okay, let's look on into it. Closer to this calculation involved for every step. For the proportional control, essentially we say it's a very simple idea. I want to stabilize it. Remember, for this is a step, the feedback control and feed forward controller are designed separately. For the feedback, the purpose is for the stabilization. Therefore, the reference signal is zero. Then we say, okay, it's a kind of just a proportional error. Why it is minus? Because the error signal is zero minus x. You get a minus sign. Then we try to analyze why, how does the stability change after the feedback. If I were plug in this, we say, okay, the matrix has changed from five to five minus gamma. AO. Then we say, if the system is controllable, the post can be placed at anywhere, right? Uh, to show that, we, we use the controllable canonic form. Remember why people introduce that controllable canonic form, right? The purpose actually is to solve the pole placement problem. You can see that the solution is extremely simple. And from that one, we get the Eichmann's formula. Of course, you don't like to, if you don't like using this formula, you can always do it and with the other or we go a more direct way, right? You just get the correct polynomial of the closed loop system. This polynomial, of course, will depend upon the gains you are going to use. <clears throat> you compare this polynomial with the desired polynomial from the reference model, you will have a set of equations. Then you find out the design parameters. Okay. If the system is uncontrollable, can we still place the pose to any desired locations? Uncontrollable, remember, uh, uncontrollable means that some of the poles you cannot change, okay? If you can change all the poles, it must be controllable. Then if the uncontrollable poles are stable, also remember, uh, uncontrollable does not mean you cannot control, okay? It just means, right, you cannot place all the poles to any place you like, but if those uncontrollable poles, right, are already stable, you don't have to change them. Then we call such a system, right, stabilizable. We can still control the system to some degree. Okay? Stabilizable. Now, for the observer, The interesting part of observer is that if we just simply use the original equation, we found it, it does not work, right? We want to make the prediction, but if we use original equation, it does not work. Then we realize we have to also use the feedback mechanism to improve its performance. Because the output of the controller, right, is supposed to follow the real output. So therefore the feedback signal is from the real output we compare the real output with the, the output of the observer, right, will make the difference. We therefore we put that error signal into the original model, 
that makes it work. We can use this one to estimate the state variance. Remember, right? I mean, this this one is the observer. And easily uh, from this one, you can you can get try to analyze error signals. You can say you can design the K, right, to make those five minus K stable. And also probably not unstable, you can even place the post to anywhere you like. For that one, we have this I commands formula for the observer design. But if you don't like it, right. Again, you can always rely on the direct comparison. You get the polynomial, correct this polynomial for the list five minus KC, you compare it with the desired one. And then about the post for the controller, right? Desired post for the controller and also the desired post for the observer. Those two posts are different. How do you design the post for the desired controller? For the controller, that is performance requirements, right? You say, okay, I, I require it to have some overshoot of uh, 10%, less than 10%. You know, I want the certainty time to be five seconds. From those ones, we try to build the reference model. That one give you the post for the controller, but for the observer, right? Because you have a different requirement, okay? and. Uh, in the part one, right, normally, you know, let's say in the exams, probably the simplest case, I just, you know, put the post of controller to the zero, we say, we make it very fast. But remember that the dead beat, of, that's what we call the dead beat observer. That is not an observer you are going to use in practice uh, because there are some limitations there. It is quite sensitive uh, to noise, to deal with the noise, why you are going to use other type of uh, observer. Okay, we are going to talk about that in a while. But anyway, the point I want to mention, those A not, they are, is not the same as the, the model for the reference model, okay? So finally, you have this uh, output feedback controller, right? Uh, let's say in the exams, don't forget uh, to, uh, to write down the last answer. Right? You just write the answer this way, probably you are going to get one mark. You are, uh, those, uh, you don't throw away those uh, easy, right, those easy marks. You get it. If you don't write it down, you may lose marks. And also, of course, the worst mistake is that you just give me that, you know, the ARK, use the ICMAS formula, get the ARK. You don't write down anything about how you design. What's the equation? What's the algorithm for your observer? You should write down uh, the complete procedure, not just give me the matrix or the vector. Okay, now to, uh, to deal with the disturbance, we say um, for the state space model, right, it's a bit involved, but we have to treat the disturbance as the state variable, right? Uh, and then we first have to assume that we know the state variables and also the disturbance. Then we design the game for the disturbance or what we got. Okay, and then we will okay re analyze the closed loop equation. Then how do we choose error what we got? Okay, and we'll try to make this term to be zero, such that the disturbance can completely eliminate it, but in many cases it cannot happen. If it does not happen, then we'll have to get the transfer function. Analyze the transfer function from the disturbance to the output. Of course, how you get the transfer function, right? You use the Z transform to get the transfer function. And also, if the equation involves multiple inputs, right? Like in this case, you have the. But here, of course, when we look at this, it, it, you, if you regard the omega as the the input, there is, there is only one input because, right? If omega is the input, then you get the transfer function. If you have multiple inputs, to get the transfer function from one input 
to the outputs, right? Just assume that all other inputs are zero, right? You use the supervisation principle to get the transfer function separately. So once you get the transfer function, we are, are ask the question, right? If the disturbance is a constant, how to make its output zero? Which, if that can happen, just means that the DC gain and the steady state gain will be zero, right? So in this way, you make this to be zero. That will solve the problem. This is one of the questions you are supposed to solve for the one problem in the second homework assignment. Then we say, okay, um, when, right, this is this step, right, when you know the state variables and the disturbance, you build that, of course, when in the real case, you don't have those numbers available, right, you have to build an observer to do it, right? You use observer to estimate both the state and the disturbance. Okay, then. We we'll talk about the tracking problem. How to match the reference model? If you want to match the reference model, you need to build a feed forward controller. Okay, and the way you will say okay, the closed loop transfer function is the feed forward transfer function times b over a n. And then we say I want to match the reference model. Then this is the way you compute your Feed forward, right? So you can see to build the feed forward transfer function, right? This one is feed forward, and uh, we'll uh, just use this formula. Then under the world's organized, okay. Um, <clears throat> what's the condition for perfect tracking? Then we we say, okay, this one just by those two transfer functions, we can we'll realize, right? This is because eventually we come at match the reference model. And also we know that the input output follows right the transfer function. From that one, we can get the transfer function from the command signal to the out input. Then we realize this one, we to make sure that the input is bounded, the zeros have to be stable. Okay, so that is the condition. We encounter this condition right in all the controller design. But you see, if I, if the system, let's say, does not satisfy this condition, right? Then there is a simpler design, right? Not the simple design I mentioned at the beginning, right? We say, uh, for the second approach, right? We say, okay, I, I just match the post and then. The other part was uh, I just make the transfer, the state state again to be one. But you need a, a per perfect tracking, we need this condition. Okay, and then we, uh, last week we'll talk about the input output model approach. For this one, we also need uh, two controllers design, the feedback controller and the feed forward controller. Now, what's the closed loop transfer function from the command signal to the output? We, we derived that right from the, this formula we have for the basic configuration. The closed loop transfer function is the feed forward transfer function over the one plus open loop. From that formula, we derive first get the transfer function from the feed forward control signal to the output. So then this is the Feed forward transfer function, and then the those two are the multiply those two that is open loop transfer function. Use that formula, you get this one. From that one, we say okay, uh, we can compute the transfer function from common signal to the out to the output, right? Just multiply by t over r. This r will be cancelled out. Then we'll get t b over this a r plus b s. Okay, for this approach, remember, if you want to, if you want to match the reference model, right? We know that in this one, right? In this 
transfer function B is appears on the numerator, if you use this approach and you want to follow the reference model, you have to cancel out this B. Otherwise, it will not match the reference model. Okay? So the zero cancellation is a must. You have to do it. But of course, there is condition. If B is stable, you can cancel it out. How do we cancel it out? Right? You just put this B as a part of R. As a part of R, you do it, then you will follow the reference model because your closed loop will contain B, and the B will be cancelled out, right? So finally, this AR plus BS, right, is AM times AO times B, B will be cancelled out. Then you put this BN as a part of your T, and also you can design your A, A naught, right, as a part of your T it will be cancelled out. That will complete the design for the feed forward part, okay? Um, and you can follow the reference model completely. You require those stable inverse conditions. So when you do this, we also know, okay, we, this A naught, of course, this A naught is different from the A naught in the state space approach, right? So normally when we design, because we want this cancelled out, this A naught R, we just use a very simple polynomial, right? Put all the poles at the origin, we use Z. Depends upon the degree, R. could it be Z, could it be Z square, could it be Z cubic. Depends upon how many more degree, R. Do you want to increase the closed loop? Any questions? And also, there is another type of uh, two degree of freedom controller, right? We don't use T over R, but instead we just designed with a completely new transfer function. In this way, we say, okay, we just follow the same way. And, uh, and then it turns out this will be the final transfer function. Right? And then we want this final transfer function, we say, okay, I just choose my R and S to match AM. But of course, so I have to increase the degree. So it will be AM times AO. Then from this way, I can compute the this one. Just make this to match the PM over AM, then we'll get my transfer function. This is the formula for the feed forward transfer function. But for that one, we also we show that it still requires the condition, right? That's the stable inverse condition, right? such that you can match the reference mark completely. Okay, then for the outcomes reserve, right, for the whole design was, you first did design your S and R and then you design your feed forward. Step one, you figure out the design requirements R, right, and if you need to cancel out the zeros, so the R must contain the zero factor. And uh, if you want to reject the disturbance, it requires that the R will contain the unstable factors related to the disturbance. If the di disturbance is constant, the simplest case, uh, so R contains unstable factor, Z minus one. Then there is a causality condition. Uh, the degree of R has to be bigger than or equal to S, but we don't require a causality condition, say, or we don't require same condition on this feed forward part because we, Assume that we know the common signal in the future. Step two, once we know the design requirement of R, right, then you go ahead to solve this Galvanite equation. And then, of course, in this way, you just plug in the expression of your R and S. There are some, uh, you have to figure out the coefficient of this polynomial, right? 
So you compare those two polynomials, right? Get the asset of equations. Step three, you choose your feed forward pass to satisfy other design requirements. And in the in this whole procedure, if you realize you don't have enough freedom, then you can always increase the degree of the controller. But always remember when you increase that, always you have to satisfy the causality condition. Okay, and um, in the past, let's say in the exam papers or in the homework assignment, some students make mistakes in this part of causality condition, and some students make a mistake that the the place the pose the place the pose to unstable position, or the place the pose of the observer to unstable position. Those mistakes, of course, are very critical. Right, will cost a lot. So it's like you know, if you write the answer, if you don't have the numeric answer, you will get a higher marks than students who computed answer but they put the post to the wrong position. Okay, so therefore, be careful. Huh? I mean. Because that one just says, okay, there are some very fundamental watches to get about where you place the codes. Okay. Um, okay, then this is the last part we mentioned today, right? For today's uh, wise way, the concept of predictor, that's the most important watch. Once you know the predictor, then the rest is simple, right? Just, uh, you know, uh, compute the input such that the output, huge output, can match the desired. You have the predictor, you put the future value, match the desired one, right? And then you can compute the input. Okay, and then for the linear systems, so we have to know how do we construct the predictor? Right. Uh, and this one we do it can do it step by step. So I think it's better you do it step by step. Of course, there is also there are formulas for you to do it, right? But anyway, uh, I think in this way, if you do it step by step, right, you know clearly right what is happening. So we re we first write down an equation where such that you know the input appears in this equation. Then you try to construct the predictor model, right? And in, in, in this process, whenever you have a signals in the future, right, just match the prediction with the day. Those, uh, I mean, those uh, values we is predicted, but the controller is that once you have the predictor, you match the prediction with the desired output. So this idea can be applied to the linear systems. About how you do that, right? We say this one, you do it, right? Get the equation where you have this UK, convert it into a form of predictor. You just replace the future values with, with the prediction. Okay, you know how to predict yk plus one? Then for yk plus two, right? Just, uh, you know, with this equation, you are going to use the prediction of yk plus one to predict yk plus two. Then, you do it for all the other equations, then you get, you know, how you get predicted yk plus d minus y, why you are going to use the, the predicted equations. Finally, we can get the predictor for. Okay, so let's talk about uh, something about what you are going to learn in part two. We know that the step ahead of feedback control actually only minimize this cost function, right? Minimize the prediction error. Or you want to have only focus on how you can make the output follow the desired output, but you forget right? you, you forget about the expense or the cost on the control signal. In reality, we have to achieve a balance between uh, how we bring the output to the desired one and, and also the cost of the control effort. 
this is the model predictive control that the motivation behind that spread. That is one of the main topic in part two, right? You're going to spend three weeks on that. Then there's another part, right, which is originated from this uh, observer design in our part. We we'll have this observer, we know, okay, um, we we'll have to do that again, right, for the observer to work, how to choose K. For simplicity, right, we say, we can just choose K to achieve dead B. But dead B can be sensitive to noise. We we'll never use that bit in reality. But what is the K? Or how to design the K in real world applications? In this part, we didn't consider the noise, right? And also, because of the noise, we cannot use the dead bit. There is an optimal way to design this scan, which is called the common filter. It turns out that the gain, right? Should not be a constant. It should be depends upon. It should depends upon the time. Okay, become the time vary, but how you do it, right? That will be the common filter. Right? That's another major topic for part two of top part two. Two topics. One is the model predictive control, which is the uh, kind of right popular one in theory and also in practice. Okay, and uh, you want to have a balance between the control effort and the output error. And then the other one is the common filter. Common filter has a lot of applications, not only for control design, uh, it can be used for other applications, right? When other applications you can uh, you can design the common filter to estimate variables. A very typical applications of this observer is for some application, let's say you want to measure something, but currently probably that sensor is too expensive, right? Or probably it's too difficult to measure it directly. Remember, now you already took this course, you know the answer, right? You don't have to buy the sensor to measure it directly. Uh, instead, you use this for language, right? Try to build a model to con connect the signal you want to some other signals. You use to measure, you can use by a very cheap sensor to measure the other signals and then use the model to estimate the signals you want. In this way, you can save a lot of money, right? You use a cheap signal, right? To to get a more expensive one, or sometimes probably impossible to measure it directly. Okay? Think about that. Sometimes you say, I don't know the signal, I don't stop there. Just think about some other way to get it. If you cannot do it directly, use something huh, to do it indirectly. Common filter is a very commonly used one to do it. Okay. Okay, the final, let's say, okay, then let's say some of the real applications. We know that the control systems are every, everywhere, of course. Robotics is a very important application of the control system design, right? How do we, let's say, robot, how to walk, you know, how they move their arms. And, then, and we know that the, of course, the robotic manipulator now are widely available in the industry, right? If you go to some of the high tech, you can say those robots, those products are made by those uh, robots already. Of course, there are other interesting applications we know those human noise, right? Let's look at the possible future the, from the movies.
1984. These were taken at a mall in Reseda. Today. You killed 17 police officers that night. What it's like to try to kill one of these things. No! No! Listen to me very carefully. Come with me if you want to live. Of course, that that is the nightmare, right? And also, that is the, you know, that's why people are worried, right? I mean, how the human being can create something, right? Uh, destroy the humanity, and uh, of course, that's a very advanced robot. And how far are we? So let's say the the present, uh, the you already know this from the atlas, right? Let's look at the atlas from the first dynamics. What do they catch it long?
we can say that the, you know that the the robots can do something that the common person cannot do, right? Of course, the movement down in the acrobats can can do it. Probably nobody in this room can do it. Okay, and the okay the problem is that right now we design the robot in a way such that of course they follow our order. Right? I mean they you know, write those programs, but remember. There are two resources. One source is that the, probably there is some bug in the in the code. That is the, you from the software. The other, the other thing that probably right the hardware may, you know that the hardware involves many things. Probably some some of the parts misfunction, will function right. I mean the, you hope. If that happens, it may trigger something that unexpected. That may have some chain reaction that will cause some issues. It's like we design system to make it, you know, do something, but because of some other reasons, it may not do it according to the plan. But if you have some chain reactions and then something can happen, right? If something goes wrong, but of course here, what I show is not real, right? Just for fun. I don't know. Indeed, right? People are worried, so there is a call for balance. It you sounds know. like the plot of a sci fi flick. Yeah, but major players in the tech and science industries are warning world leaders an artificial intelligence arms race could be a problem in the future. Tesla CEO Elon Musk, Apple co founder Steve Wozniak, and renowned physicist Stephen Hawking, among other prominent figures are warning world leaders of the potential problem as autonomous military weapons continue to grow. In a letter presented at the International Joint Conference on Artificial Intelligence in Buenos Aires, 
The group says AI technology has reached a point where the deployment of autonomous weapons is practically, if not legally, feasible within years, not decades, and the stakes are high. Autonomous weapons have been described as the third revolution in warfare after gunpowder and nuclear arms. The argument, as The Guardian points out, is going to war would be an easier decision if robots are the ones fighting. Drone strikes are already a contentious issue in the U.S., but reliable statistics for how many are killed by those strikes overseas every year are tough to come by. Civilian deaths caused by drones are also an issue, though President Obama's defended their use. Actually, drones have not caused a huge number of civilian casualties. Uh, they, for the most part, they have been very precise, precision strikes against al-Qaeda and their affiliates. And we are very careful in terms of how it's been applied. Musk has warned of this kind of AI takeover before, including this August 2014 tweet reading, we need to be super careful with AI, potentially more dangerous than nukes. The letter asks the United Nations to ban the use of autonomous weapons. All right, okay, so with that, I will end my session so that will be all for part one. So for part two, you are going to have a, a, a different professor that will talk about the MPC and the common future. Okay, thank you.